treatment options. Well, there's a lot of individual variation here. Uh, no two pa patients are the same. So it's very hard to talk about treatment options because that's really something you do with your doc, sitting in the room saying, you know, this is my personal situation based on this kind of data. So, but let's run through some of the things just in general. Um, let's start with sleep. Sleep. Well, most patients with chronic fatigue syndrome have non-restorative sleep. And that comes from a lack of deep sleep, which is called slow wave sleep in the sleep clinic. A lack of slow wave sleep. It's very limited to none. And during slow wave sleep, you have most of the restorative stuff happens that happens during the night. So that's why one would wake up exhausted. But a lot of chronic fatigue patients also have or develop over time sleep apnea. So this is a rather important thing. 40 to 60 percent by our own uh, clinical count here. Um, little bias there because I tend to send people for sleep studies with the most severely, um, you know, most severe sleep, sleep uh, history. But still, 40 to 60 percent of the patients that we send to sleep, sleep labs for sleep studies have at least some element of apnea in their evaluations. That's a catch-22. On one hand, you have people who are sleeping very lightly and they wake up very easily and they feel like they're half awake all night long, uh, no matter how many hours they sleep, if it's just a few or way too many. Um, and then you have another group, of, or in the same group sometimes, patients who, when they do fall into deeper sleep, develop a disordered breathing pattern that causes them to not get enough oxygen for short periods of time, which is rather dangerous. So uh, you have to know who is who. Uh, you, you could just give people sleep medicines and say, here, this will put you into a deeper sleep. Here, this is the magic bullet for you. But it could be very dangerous to someone with apnea to put them into a deeper sleep. Um, and then they would have these much more and longer episodes of, of not breathing and not getting enough oxygen. So step one is knowing who is who. And there are less expensive and more expensive ways of figuring out if somebody has apnea something so simple as a pulse oximeter overnight to a full EEG wires and all over my brain uh, sleep study, which is the more typical thing done in a sleep lab. But knowing this is rather important. If someone does not have apnea, then the advice is pretty straightforward. We need to get this person to fall asleep and get into a deeper sleep. Now most docs, when they ask you, how do you sleep, you say, oh, terrible. And what they hear is insomnia. And then what you said, oh, I sleep terribly. And they hear, I can't fall asleep. And they give you some short acting little hypnotic, like um, Restoril or Ambien or something like that, that just helps you fall asleep at night. Some little Valium derivative drug. Now here's a dilemma. The Valium derivative drugs, like, like, uh, cl like Clonopin and Restoril and so on, a little less so Ambien, they actually steal slow wave sleep away from you. They actually can contribute to the problem. So a lot of my patients are on the wrong sleeping bed because their doc heard them say, I can't sleep at night, and they put them on a kind of medicine that would actually make it worse instead of better. So the first thing I do is go through the drug list and see if I can get that stuff off. Um, if I have to use a sleeping med, I try to use an old-fashioned sleeping medicine that um, lasts a long, long time. Over the course of, of the years of, of developing new medicines, most of the sleep meds were, were hypnotics, these ones to help you fall asleep. And the idea was to get them all the way out of your body by the time you woke up in the morning so you had no hangover, because that's a terrible complaint of taking sleep meds, feeling groggy the next day. But if you have a medicine that's only on board for a couple of hours, it's really not covering you very well, because you guys don't sleep all night long very well. So using the old-fashioned medicines like Benadryl, which is a, you know, an antihistamine, uh, use a lot of doxepin, which is a prescription, uh, also an antihistamine, tricyclic and an antihistamine. Um, there's a lot of use of tricyclic antidepressants in really low doses, mainly because they're not for any antidepressant effect, because at that dose it does not antidepress it, but because they're very, very uh, good at inducing a deeper stage of sleep. So those are kind of the simple things to do. Uh, 
there are some medicines that are slow wave sleep inducers. Again, they're by prescription, and some of them are really uh, big guns and have to be managed by a proper sleep doctor. Uh, there's a medicine called Zyrum that's coming out for fibromyalgia um, in the next few months. It just completed a clinical trial, and it's very good. It induces slow wave sleep, and it induces it very quickly. It's very exciting medicine, very expensive medicine, very scary medicine because it can be overdosed. It has to be used very, very tenderly. So um, there's some very promising stuff out there, and it might be right for you. It might not. It takes an expert to sit down with you and try to hash it out. But you need an expert that's listening to the whole sleep story, not just the insomnia piece or, or I can't sleep at night. Um, other kinds of things that can really help a chronic fatigue patient. I talked uh, earlier about um, blood pressures falling precipitously, that suddenly having crashes because the blood pressure falls. Well, this is a complex issue. It's got a big medical name. It's called neurally mediated hypotension. It means that the brain is sending the wrong signal to the blood vessels and letting your blood pressure fall instead of rise. When you need it more, you get less. And so the treatments are a little complicated. Again, they're out there. There are things to do. You can uh, take, if you don't have high blood pressure, you can take salt to increase your blood volume. You can take um, medications that either slow your heart rate so that there's more time per beat to fill up your heart or medicines that vasoconstrict that cause your, um, arter your veins, not your arteries, your veins to vasoconstrict so that your blood can't pull in your legs so much. But there's some very simple things too. Something so simple as um, wearing, in a woman's case, this is harder on guys, pantyhose. The pantyhose that um, are the, the uh, kind you wear that have some support. So um, basically pressure stockings or pressure hose. And if you do that route, um, you, yeah, and anybody that's ever been in nursing or teaching probably has already learned this trick. Anyone's on their feet all day. To wear a pressure hose, with the control top panty, panty hose that also puts some pressure on the belly because that's also where you pull. So the kind that acts a little girdle-ish plus, plus uh, gives you some support in your legs can be a very non-drug way of preventing some of these crashes. Um, salt if you're not uh, hypertensive. Now here's a funny thing. Chronic fatigue patients that have this problem have higher blood pressures when they're lying down than when they're sitting up. And most of us take blood pressures when you're sitting up. So we might not know you're hypertensive because we didn't check it while you were lying down. Another good reason to own your own blood pressure cuff because you can check your pressure when you're lying flat in the morning, when you get up and check it about 10 minutes later to see if it changed and then during any crash and get a sense of whether or not you get a lot of blood pressure or pulse variation. With one of those easy little machines you just push the button and it blows up the thing on your arm and reads out the reading on that screen for you. Very handy gadget to try to self-monitor. Again, that's kind of neat stuff you can bring to your doctor's office. If you have a blood pressure reading and a pulse reading that for about a week's time before you come into the doctor, very helpful. I would act on that information if someone handed me that information. So, so that's kind of useful. A lot of people complain about cognitive dysfunction and chronic fatigue, and it's very real. And it's probably from neuroinflammation and a lack of blood flow, and it's complicated. There's more than one thing going on. But in the end, the studies that have been done have shown that your brain can still do all that hard work, but it's not as efficient at doing it. It takes longer. You actually have a slower response time. And it's because the part of your brain that was doing that, let's say you were doing mental math. And normally, if you've been doing mental math all your life, there's a part of your brain about the size of a cashew that does all of that work. But in chronic fatigue, something disrupts the pathway so that all that work isn't being done in just one spot. And you have to ask the, the opposite side of your brain to chime in and other areas of your brain. And you see these neat studies with it, with the elect where the electrical activity is just ping-ponging all around the brain, maybe 16 different areas so that you could do a mental math. And that results in a nanosecond or so of delay in your ability to, to process all that information. And you feel that because you're so used to being sharp and clear and quick that you notice that little nanosecond. Hard to measure. It's really hard to measure in research, but we can, and we have, and it's there. Um, so what can you do? You can rewire. One of the neat things about the brain is that you can rewire the brain. If those pathways were lost and that little cashew doing the 
doing the mental math. You can lay the pathways back down by doing mental math, mental math, mental math, until finally you get your pathways back. The biggest complaint people have is short-term memory and concentration. Well, if you're as old as me, which predates computers, you might remember a game called Concentration, where you just laid the whole deck of cards flat, you got all the cards turned over, and you, you had to try to remember, where did I see that eight? Where did I see that four? You're making pairs, and the game is everyone can keep on going until you, make, you can't make any pairs. That's short-term memory and concentration. You had to concentrate on where, where the card was, and you had to have enough short-term memory to recall that you just had seen it in a few moments ago. There's a lot of games like this, and there's a bunch on the computer too that are basically rewiring your short-term memory. And you gotta do those every single day. If you don't have those pathways, they're not gonna come back all by themselves. They need some help. So you've gotta actually figure out what's not working and what is the game for that. And there's some websites that can help you with this. There's a lot of memory websites, you know. Most of us getting older are worried about all our concentration and memory problems to begin with, so there's a lot of websites sort of aimed at us.